Mark, thank you very much for that generous introduction. And thank all of you for being strong trade unionists. Thank all of you for standing up not only for your own membership, but for the working people of our country. And before I get into the specific issues that I have been working on for a number of years in terms of the Postal Service, let me tell you what I think all of you already know, that there is something fundamentally wrong in our country today, both economically and politically. And what is wrong is that for the last 40 years, there has been a war against the working class of this country. And the results of that is despite huge increases in technology and productivity, the average, the median male worker, median female worker in this country, ordinary people, are working longer hours for lower wages. Millions of Americans today in the wealthiest country in the history of the world are working two or three jobs in order to cobble together the income and the health care they need to take care of their families. And while millions of our families are struggling to put bread on the table and take care of their kids, while we have as a nation the highest rate of childhood poverty of any major country on earth, almost all of the new income and the new wealth generated in America is going to the top 1%. That has got to change. Does anybody here, does anybody in America think that it makes sense that the top one-tenth of one percent own almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent? Does anybody think that it is acceptable that 58 percent of all new income generated today goes to the top 1%. No. What this campaign is about is bringing the vast majority of our people together to say that we want, we need, and we will have an economy that works for working families and not just the billionaire class. A few weeks ago, we introduced legislation that says, no, we are not going to sit back and allow corporate America to go to war against trade unions. We are going to make it easier for workers to join unions. Because we know what Scott Walker and all of those guys are about. We know that when they go to war against unions, what they are doing is taking away the constitutional right of workers to freely assemble and negotiate contracts. And what they are also doing, which we know, is that if they destroy the trade union movement in America, who is going to be able to stand up to the corporate agenda? So our job together is to grow the trade union movement and fight back every step of the way to those who want to break it.
Now, I am the ranking member, leader of the Democrats in opposition on the Senate Budget Committee. And when we talk about the corporate agenda, let me tell you what they have in mind. The media doesn't report this too often. Let me tell you what they have in mind. First of all, virtually every Republican candidate for president, not all, but almost all, want to cut Social Security. Now, you got millions of seniors in my state all over this country trying to get by on twelve, thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars a year, figuring out how they're going to buy medicine, how they're going to feed themselves, how they heat their homes. And these guys want to cut Social Security. We say no. Not only are we not going to cut Social Security, we're going to expand Social Security benefits. And as Mark said, the simple way to do it is you lift the cap. Somebody's making a million dollars today a year, pays the same amount into Social Security, somebody's making 118,000. Lift that cap, start at 250,000, we're going to expand benefits. And the Republican agenda says, well, let's voucherize. Let's cut Medicare over my dead body. Now, we're not going to cut Medicare. We're going to guarantee Medicare for all to every man, woman, and child. Now, you tell me why in the United States of America we are the only major country on earth, the only one, that doesn't guarantee health care to all people as a right. We've got to end that embarrassment. And we've got to end the embarrassment of being the only major country on earth that doesn't guarantee paid family and medical leave. And when millions of people in our country are working for starvation wages, we are going to raise the minimum wage to a living wage, 15 bucks an hour. And when our infrastructure, our roads and bridges and water systems are collapsing, we're going to rebuild them and create up to 13 million decent paying jobs. But none of that happens, brothers and sisters. None of that happens unless we stand together. That's what the history of the union movement is about. That's what a union is. Your understanding is you cannot do it alone. You've got to work with your brothers and sisters to stand together and fight for what is right. And that is what we have got to do as a nation. It's no great secret. Everybody knows that big money and Wall Street and corporate America and super PACs, big campaign donors, they determine what goes on in Washington, D.C. No great secret. We will not change that when 63% of the American people do not vote, as was the case in the last election. We will not change it when people say, I'm giving up on politics, I got other things to do. Our job is, in fact, to create a political revolution which brings working people together. A revolution which says that in this great country, our government belongs to all of us and not just a handful of billionaires. And that is what this campaign is about. 
And when we stand together as one people, not allowing us to be divided up by race or the country we came from or our sexual orientation or whether we're men or whether we're women, when we stand together, millions of people demanding a decent life for our kids and our parents, there is nothing that can stop us from winning. Now, all of you know better than I what the Postal Service is about. And what the beauty of the Postal Service, and by the way, thank you for making the U.S. Postal Service the most popular agency of the United States government. Thank you. And the strength of the Postal Service as you all know, and what many people sometimes take for granted, is that the Postal Service provides universal, universal service six days a week to every corner of America, no matter how small, no matter how remote. In other words, if you're a big business, you get your mail six days a week. If you're a low-income person on a dirt road, in a small town in Vermont, you get your mail six days a week. And what the Postal Service also provides is that we have 500,000 decent paying union jobs And as the former chairman of the Senate Veterans Committee, the Postal Service is the largest employer of veterans. And let me, at this point, thank all of our veterans for their service to our country. Yet, despite the popularity of the Postal Service, despite the good work of the Pope Postal Service, it is under constant and vicious attack. And as somebody who has been as active as any member of the U.S. Congress in trying to protect the Postal Service, I can tell you firsthand, the attacks never stop. It is absolutely true that we have people in Congress and wealthy corporate interests who want nothing else but to privatize and destroy the United States Postal Service, but we are not going to allow them to do that. Now, why do they want to do it? Well. Truthfully, it is the same reason that they want to privatize Social Security, same reason they want to destroy Medicare, they want to destroy public education. Welcome to the club. These guys do not believe in government in any way. And if there are private sector companies that can make money and huge profits, by delivering mail and packages, that is what they want, but we are not going to allow them to do that. We are not going to allow them to destroy the universality of the Postal Service and pick and choose. They can make money going to Park Avenue in New York, they lose money going to rural Vermont, we are not going to let them make that choice. Now, as many of you know, a few years ago, the Postmaster General came up with a disastrous plan for the Postal Service. You all know that, and this is what that plan would have done. It would have eliminated, ended, 
about 220,000 Postal Service jobs, including the jobs of many veterans. It would have closed about 15,000 post offices throughout the country. It would have eliminated over half of the mail processing plants in this country. It would have ended Saturday mail delivery. Every person in this room, and many of us in the Senate and the House, fought back against this disastrous plan. And while we did not, and I have to be honest with you, we did not get everything that we wanted, we did get the Postal Service to significantly revise their plan. So instead of closing down 15,000 postal offices, what they did is reduce the hour of services at about 13,000 post offices throughout the country. What they did is instead of closing down over half of the mail processing plants in this country, the Postal Service has kept about 100 of these plants that were originally on the chopping block open. And although it took an act of Congress, literally an act of Congress, six-day mail delivery is still the law of the land. Now, the bad news is that the Postmaster General has eliminated, as all of you know, as the people of my state know, as the people all over America know, and are extremely unhappy about, the Postmaster General has eliminated overnight delivery standards for first-class mail. And another 80 mail processing plants are in danger of shutting down next year, and Saturday mail delivery is still under attack. Well, I have got a message for the Postmaster General, for my colleagues in the Congress, and for the President of the United States. At a time when the middle class of our country is disappearing and the number of Americans living in poverty is at a record high, do not destroy middle class jobs in the Postal Service. At a time when senior citizens all over this country and small businesses all over this country depend upon the Postal Service operating six days a week, you will not end Saturday mail delivery. At a time when the Postal Service is competing with the instantaneous communications of email and high-speed internet services to stop slowing down the delivery of mail, speed it up. And do not, do not dismantle the Postal Service by shutting down even more mail processing plants throughout this country. Now, I've given you some bad news about what they originally wanted to do and what has happened, but let me give you some good news. And that is, despite what you read in the papers every other month, despite what you hear from the Postmaster General, the U.S. Postal Service is not going broke. All of you know that the major reason that the Postal Service is in bad financial shape is because of a mandate signed into law by President Bush in December of 2006. And that mandate forces the U.S. Postal Service to pre-fund 
75 years of future retiree health benefits over a 10-year period. There is no other agency of government, there is no corporation in the private sector that we know of in America that has a burden like this. None, only the U.S. Postal Service. This onerous and unprecedented burden that cost five and a half billion dollars a year is responsible for all of the financial losses posted by the Postal Service. And here is something that the people who write these newspaper articles don't understand. And that is from October of 2012 until today, the U.S. Postal Service has made an operating profit, more money coming in than going out, of more than $2 billion, excluding the pre-funding mandate. And before this pre-funding mandate was signed into law, the Postal Service was also profitable. In fact, from 2003 through 2006, the Postal Service made a combined profit of more than $9 billion. Now, what we are trying to do in Congress right now, and what I will do as President of the United States, is to end this pre-funding mandate. And when, and when we end that outrageous mandate, we will allow the Postal Service to thrive and prosper into the future. And let me tell you what else we're going to do. Because it's fair to say there are challenges. The world is changing. And we have got to do more to make the Postal Service a 21st century operation. What do we have to do? But this is what we've got to do. First thing is we have to reestablish strong overnight delivery standards to ensure the timely delivery of mail. And I am getting complaints in my state, and the complaints are coming all over the country. Because since the Postal Service rolled back these standards last year, Nearly 500 million pieces of mail were not delivered on time, up 48% since last year. That is not acceptable. That has got to change. <laughs> Under these new standards, in some cases, it is taking nine or even 11 days for veterans and senior citizens to receive the life-saving prescription drugs they need through the mail. That is not acceptable. As President, not only would I work to prevent the closure of hundreds of mail processing plants throughout this country, I would work to reopen many of the plants that have been shut down. It is abundantly clear that the Postal Service's decision to shut down more than 140 mail processing plants a few years ago has been a disaster that is negatively impacting American businesses and American citizens all over this country. As President, I would prevent the Postal Service from ending six-day mail delivery. In my view, the Postal Service cannot be saved 
by ending one of its major competitive advantages. <clears throat> Cutting six-day <coughs> delivery is not a viable plan for the future. It will lead to a death spiral that will harm Americans while doing nothing to improve the financial conditions of the Postal Service. Providing fewer services and less quality will cause more customers to seek other options. In other words, the more they dismantle and attack the Postal Service, the more it creates a death spiral. And more and more people will cease to come in to the Postal Service. That is a spiral that has got to be reversed. As President, I would allow the Postal Service to recoup over $50 billion in overpayments it has made to the civil service retirement system. Because of these overpayments, the Postal Service has been forced to subsidize the entire federal government. That's wrong. As President, I would give the Postal Services the new tools it needs to compete in the 21st century by allowing it to sell innovative new products, services, and raise more revenue. For example, a recent report from the Postal Service Inspector General suggests that almost $9 billion a year could be generated by providing affordable financial services to tens of millions of Americans who desperately need it. Low-income Americans should not be forced to go to rip off check-cashing storefronts or payday lenders. The Postal Service could fill that gap. In my view, we have got to give the Postal Service the authority to do what other countries throughout the world are doing to respond to the shift toward electronic mail and away from hard copy mail. The point here is that the Postal Service must be allowed to innovate and implement a successful business strategy for a changing world. It makes no sense to me, and I remember this distinctly. I went into a postal service, bought, I had bought a, a present, a, a Christmas gift for one of my grandchildren. I said, could you please wrap it up? No, nope, it's against the law. You can't do that. Can't do that. Oh, what about making 10 copies of this document? Sorry. It's against federal law to make 10 copies of that document. Well, I'm living in a rural area. Can you notarize the document for me? No, it's against the law. I'm living in a small town someplace. Can I get a hunting license or a fishing license? Nope, can't do that. I have some wine or a beer that I want to send across the country. Can't do that. So in other words, what we have seen is federal law tying the hands of the Postal Service's capability of competing. And that has got to change. And as Mark just mentioned in his introductory remarks, let me be very clear. As President, I will only nominate individuals to the Postal Service's Board of Governors who are committed to strong overnight delivery standards. We do not need people 
on the Board of Governors whose desire is to destroy the U.S. Postal Service. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, for over 230 years and enshrined in our Constitution, the Postal Service has played an unbelievably important role for the people of our country and for our entire economy. And that mission today remains as important as it has ever been. So let us stand together and fight to save the Postal Service, not destroy it. Let us give the Postal Service the tools that it needs to effectively compete in the 21st century, not tie its hands. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, thank you not only for the work you do every day, but being part of the trade union movement and fighting to make sure that all of our people can live in dignity and security. Thank you all very much. <laughs>